In keeping with practice, new machine, new feature build, and given how large these things are getting, I should be able to lay out a 7th order bandpass, turning this unassuming 4-inch mid-bass into a surprisingly capable subwoofer. Just to set the stage, at the time of the unboxing there were literally no search results for this machine anywhere on Google or YouTube, so we're talking fairly new. Indeed, this is the Neptune 3 Plus from Elegoo and it features an oversized 320 by 320 mm build surface riding on top of the already well received Neptune 3 platform. So you get the 4.3 inch removable touchscreen and a pair of belt synchronized Z-axis motors but also a sturdier triangulated frame and a mesh leveling routine with 49 test points. Here is a Benchy printed with the included bundle of PLA and it looks really good though this is only 18 square centimeters of the build plate with another 1071 available. So let's actually put this thing to the test with the feature project. Right away this is the TCP 115-4 from Dayton Audio, a 4 inch mid bass that models quite elegantly in a number of high order acoustic arrangements, incidentally something that I'm asked about all the time. So I designed a 7th order bandpass to showcase the operating principle simultaneously giving you a chance to experience the exotics for yourself. The model starts out as 5 separate surfaces, in theory fragmenting any potential effects of thermal contraction that might otherwise cause the entire print to lift. The individual surfaces merge at a height of 3mm, by which point you'll also notice the hidden channel. We'll come back to that. The mid bass driver mounts right here and fires directly into the primary waveguide carrying the pressure into the compound passive chamber. This controls the Q of the lower pass band and incidentally had the forward pressure path begin with a chamber, this would have been an 8th order bandpass, unfortunately it would have also been far less effective, at least in this layout given the available footprint. The back wave makes its way across the one active chamber, through the secondary waveguide and into the passive chamber where the compounded resonance is filtered for output through the passive waveguide. Performance wise, I'm looking to recapture the essence of that late 1990s Bose acoustic wave music system experience, massive low end from seemingly nowhere at all. They did it with compound transmission lines, I'm doing it with a high order bandpass network which in this instance should also be quite punchy. Response wise, I'm shooting for an in room extension down into the mid 40s and then we'll try it in the car as well. Either way, the model comes together in two pieces, tongue and groove as per usual. The mid bass driver seals behind an access panel which I could 3D print, however given that I also have a CO2 laser I've opted for a sheet of acrylic with a foam gasket. Anyway, that's all the graphics so let's get to making. Right away, the machine lays down an incredibly tidy first layer, I'm genuinely impressed with the consistency across such a large build area, then again, with a 49 point snapshot of the build plate, this is more or less par for the course. What I didn't count on, however, was the tendency of this powder coated PEI sheet not to hold the print, I mean, as it stands there's really no saving this. Fortunately, the oversized build surface allows me to address upwards of 330mm of travel on both the X and the Y axis, which also means that I get to put a brim around this already full size model. So with the build plate temperature bumped up another 10 degrees, we are off to another good start. As you can see here, we made it up to the infill, though once the individual surfaces merge some 30 hours into the print, the outer edges begin to lift once again, this time with me intervening by way of anything that was immediately at hand, namely some masking tape and an assortment of clips literally holding the print down by the brim, but ultimately to no avail, as the tape comes up you can see the trouble beneath. Here, I'd like to point out that, apart from all the stringing, everything that's wrong with this print can be ascribed to a lack of base layer adhesion, so, as it stands, this 320 by 320 build platform is not suitable for 320 by 320 prints. In fact, I'd be weary of any review that doesn't actually verify this in practice. Fortunately, the problem goes away just like that, and the magnetic base accepts virtually any other build surface including this carbon steel sheet borrowed from the snapmaker which you can also find online for about 20 bucks. The machine probes around and the brim gives me a chance to baby step the nozzle clearance just so. What's more, with the print actually sticking we can finally see what the machine can do with all that build volume. As it turns out, it can do a lot and in a hurry. 0.3mm layers, 3 perimeter walls, 
four perimeter tops and bottoms, and a 40% triangular infill. Once again, the machine lays down a series of perfect layers, some very nice infill action right there. Here comes the merge, the internals, and so on until I thought I'd show you how I changed the filament. Right away, without pausing, I clip a piece to leave inside the runner detector, change spools, feed the material through without tripping the sensor, flash cut the remainder, and give the direct extruder a moment to grip the new filament. This continues uninterrupted for another 40 or so hours, at the end of which the results are pretty definitive. Not a single strand had lifted, making this my largest successful print to date, at least in terms of the footprint. This piece of tape turned out to be completely unnecessary, though still a sensible precaution as I absolutely need that corner intact. Nevertheless, the entire print looks amazing and what's left of the brim is trimmed flush with a deburring tool. Impressive is a good word to use as I set up to reprint the first half shell nut, minding in the least if these are the results I should expect. Once again, I let the machine relearn the build surface, baby stepping the brim for that perfect first layer height, and off it goes laying down those glossy layers. Meanwhile, out in the garage I got the laser working on the access panel, first cutting into a sheet of acrylic followed by some closed cell foam. Back inside, another fully successful print. We are two for two. And all it took was replacing something that Elegoo intends for you to replace anyhow. Once again, the brim comes off, leaving behind a perfect 45 degree chamfer, some cleanup on this one as well, and there they are. All set for me to wire in the electrical stuff, beginning with the binding posts, followed by a touch of the contemporary, which for better or worse, means running a tacky LED strip. I mean, why not? I'm building a toy. The wires go into the hidden channel, come out behind the driver, and terminate to a power jack. The LED strip will run halfway around the driver, so once I have the other half shell on there for reference, I just snip the excess and test the lights with one of my camera batteries. So, after I got done heat setting all these threaded inserts, Sophie appeared to JB weld the groove, and here's where I discovered a potential drawback to printing this big. Right away, here I am attaching the access panel just to ensure that it stays aligned, but as I went to press the two halves together, it became apparent that the thermal contraction had caused them to bow outward, requiring a fair bit of clamping force just to get the outer walls to meet. And here I'd like to emphasize that this is not a problem with the 3D printer. In fact, this form of dimensional instability is due to a difference in the rate of contraction between the top and the bottom of the model as it cools. An inherent property of thermoplastic which unfortunately worsens as we print larger or use materials with higher melting points like ABS or PETG. Anyhow, days later, with the epoxy given plenty of time to cure, I set out to remove the clamps. Oh, and don't mind the giant protruding box, which, by the way, just showed up at the door without notice. Uh, you have a giant 3D printer on the front door, stuff? Ella goes like, surprise, mother <laughs> Clearly, you weren't expecting this. Well, for the moment, my expectations are somewhat reserved, as the crackling you're about to hear is the sound of the two half-shells ripping themselves back apart. This presents a bit of an impasse in that the printer did exactly what it should've, unfortunately so did the thermal mechanics behind the cooling PLA, inadvertently marking a threshold for this particular design strategy. Needless to say, I'm about ready for a giant CNC machine to fall out of the sky, but not before I salvage this with some blue tech and maybe a ratchet bar in each corner, more or less bending the model back into shape. As a redundant precaution, I double sealed around the opening for the driver, and once I got that in place, I also double sealed around the access panel, which at this point is ready to attach as well. And now, for the finishing touch, this time with the full 12 volts of input. Next, the results of an in-room frequency sweep suggest that despite the enclosure coming apart at the seams, acoustically it still functions mostly as intended with the dip in the middle suggesting a breach somewhere along this boundary. Nevertheless, it still sounds incredibly punchy, in fact, here's an impromptu demo with Sophie hearing it for the very first time. looks really cool and I honestly I was not expecting that Jesus how's that punch it's definitely there that's actually really neat walk around the room so I've noticed how it doesn't really change as you move so it's not really hypersensitive to corners 
Wow. Yeah. Yeah, despite all that is hermetically wrong with it, the enclosure is still able to fill the room with a heavy chest felt impact of the base. What's more, with a proper build sheet, the Neptune Plus has earned its place in my office where it continues to lay down these silky, smooth layers ultimately forming the things that we use throughout the house. Meanwhile, it would also appear that Elogu is looking to showcase the machine's larger brother. Well, this is the Neptune Max unambiguously the largest in the Neptune series, with an oversized 420 by 420 mm platform and another one of these textured build sheets. The machine assembles just like the Neptune Plus, in fact if I mixed up the footage it probably wouldn't even matter. Once assembled it boots up to a whole lot of nothing, an update firmware message which even after an update doesn't go away. This, according to Elgu, is a symptom of the motherboard and the touch screen not communicating, so just to cover both eventualities, they sent me a new motherboard and a new touch screen. Now then, let's see if I don't have to take this thing apart. I have to take it apart. Unfortunately, what was supposed to be a main board turned out to be a box full of this lonely SD card, literally just an extra of the one that comes with the machine. So, fast forward to a later date, and apart from the actual main board this time around, on a whim I let A-Labs talk me into having a look at these, simply as they fit the running theme of absolutely zero social proof, at least at the time of the recording, and I have absolutely no idea what to expect. At any rate, let's see how many things I can balance on this filament spool, or just use it to prop up the build plate in this three-point stance as I go to remove the bottom cover. Behold the guts, and once the original mainboard is free, I let Sophie have a hot glue covering the harnesses, one by one relocating them onto the new board. Meanwhile, back in the office, my initial impressions of the HW501s suggest that perhaps the HW stands for how weird. Needless to say, whatever they're pitching is not what I'm hearing, I'll just leave it at that. Anyway, with the main board replaced, the Neptune Max is ready for round 2. On the plus side, it boots up to the interface, on the downside, it thinks it's a Neptune 3 Pro. What's more, as I go to install the correct firmware, the screen reverts to the forever after update firmware message, inadvertently making this a story for another time. In the end though, I come away with some very positive impressions of the Neptune 3 Plus, at least once fitted with a proper build sheet, and I suspect that the same would be true of a functioning Neptune 3 Max. As for the Ratchet Bar Special, just as a final send-off, I decided to exact some abuse, knocking it about the car, with nearly 100 watts going to the little 4-inch mid-base. Needless to say, it survived, but to a point, it also held its own as an actual subwoofer, which I will demo on my way to pick Sophie up from work. So, rate the video as you see fit, subscribe if you're so inclined, and I will see you in the next one. Cheers!